Okay, so I had these experiences of being a passenger on motorbikes. Uh, when I was, I think, around grade three, I actually got ran over by a motorbike. Again, you know, on my way to school, I tell the story, people laugh, and, and they, they don't believe me. Uh, but, you know, innocent child, uh, really little. I remember in Colombia, you have a, your uniform is a beautiful white shirt, which is denim jeans and black shoes. That's your school uniform. And I'm walking to school. Everyone would walk uh, down this road. Uh, there's a big line of people, teachers, children, everyone walking together. And it's just out of the blue. Didn't even hear it, didn't even see it coming. This man literally rode over me. The, the wheel caught my foot, pushed me to the ground, and he just rode straight over me and he just kept going. And um, everyone else just sort of looked. Some of my friends laughed, uh, but the expectation is get up and keep going. And I just remember feeling so broken and so humiliated and just completely embarrassed and hurt. But you know what? That's the way it is. And my kids don't believe that because they haven't experienced this. They're so sheltered. Uh, but in other countries, it's, life is completely different. Yeah. Amen. You're expected to just grow up yeah. and toughen up. Yeah. And um, yeah. that's just the expectation. It shouldn't be like that. No. But unfortunately, that's, that's the world. And so then it brings me to another experience. Um, I've experienced being a passenger on motorbikes. Experience being on by motorbikes. Um, but then it came to actually riding a motorbike. You know, it's always different when it's your turn to actually give something a go. It's one thing to be a passenger, it's one thing to, a different thing to be in charge, right? And, you know, the word of God is the same. There's many people that want to get up and they want to be the ones that preach. And I'm telling you, man, you can have that, that desire. But when it comes down to it, and the day comes, and you're like, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing. And um, <laughs> God help me. And so I got this little experience of my, um, I think I would have been in grade seven. Grade seven, grade six, actually. And um, a couple of friends of mine, they used to love motorbikes. And, you know, they, they started riding Wee 50s since, you know, they could walk. They had Wee 50s just going around um, their yard. If you know what a Wee 50 is, it's just a little tiny motorbike. Uh, they, they, their dad then from then on bought them um, a posty bike and so they had posty bikes if you've seen the postman their little red, those red bikes so these two kids had these posty bikes and they just ride them around the backyard um, until their dad finally decided you know what you're ready and, and he bought them this 125 which is like the next progression you know like a real dirt bike for a kid and, um, and my, friends, my friend thought it would be a really good idea for me to learn to ride on the 125. I'd never ridden the 50, I'd never ridden the posty, but he just thought, you know what, I'm gonna teach you to ride a motorbike today. And so, he didn't really teach me, he just said, get on and just let it go. <laughs> and so I got on and let it go, and you know what happened? He fell on his I didn't fall back, I actually held on. And so the bike just took off. And there I was in the bike, and I didn't know how to stop, I didn't know what to do, and I went straight through a fence. And this was his gift from his dad, brand new motorbike, I've crashed into the fence, destroyed his fence, and you know what, that was the first and last time that I ever rode a motorbike on my own. <laughs> and so, that's my experience with motorbikes. Why am I talking about this? Um, because, there's a difference between being a passenger and being in control. Amen? Being the one that's actually driving. And so, Colossians 2, 6 and 7, I just want to read this. It says there, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanks." Giving. Everything that we have in Christ, we have it because someone taught it to us. Whether it's your parents in their modeling and example and their way of life, whether it's someone that, that God used to speak into your life, I'm sure that we can all think of someone now that brought us into faith. 
And they had to do a great deal of work in order to convince us that this thing of the Christian life actually works. Because all of us analyze it. You know, our children are analyzing. My daughter is analyzing. My son, he's checking it out. He, he, he hasn't made a decision for Jesus yet, but he's checking all of us out every day. Let me see what these people are talking about, whether this actually works. Is, does this actually work in my parents' lives? Does this actually work in the practical? And so we will owe someone who demonstrated to us that the Christian life actually works, that it's worth living, that uh, Jesus, yes, he actually saves, that he can actually remove guilt from our hearts, that he can actually show us a new way of life. And so we have teachers of many different walks of life. Some, some teachers don't look like teachers, okay? There's people that have done things for you and demonstrated things uh, to you, and they probably didn't even align themselves as teachers or having teaching gifts. But they've taught you something. There is teachers. You know who the best teachers are? They're the ones that you don't even realize they're teaching you. And I'll give you a biblical example of that. They do it with their example. They do it with their obedience, with their faith. And with that, they pave a way. They pave a way for us to believe. Believe in Jesus. And that's the way that Jesus did it. You know, Jesus gave us the example as he washed his disciples' feet. It says there that his disciples were actually quite confused. If you read that passage, um, I think it's in John. I actually don't think I wrote this down, to be honest. In all honesty. John 13, I believe. John 13, 14. There it is. And so you can open it there. I'm not going to read it. Uh, but I just want to speak about this for a moment because it, it's a beautiful example. Jesus gets all his disciples and he says to them, I'm going to wash your feet one by one. And he does it. Uh, Peter acts up and he's like, well, you're not going to do that to me. I'm not going to let you do that. You're my master. You're my teacher. You're superior to me. I'm not going to let you touch my dirty feet. And it was quite confusing. It was quite confusing for them. Even Jesus said, you may not understand why I'm doing this, but you will. Later on, you'll understand why this is happening, why I'm washing your feet. One thing about the washing of feet, as I was just looking into this um, just briefly, is that for the people of, of that time, it was actually a daily monotonous task. Like you had to wash your feet before you ever entered into someone's house. And it was expected that whoever's house you were going to, or whatever place you're entering, there was a place there with water and, and you would wash your feet and you clean your feet before you enter their home. And Jesus actually, um, one example, he, he actually calls out a leader, um, a spiritual leader who didn't offer for him to wash his feet as he entered his house. So it, it was quite an important thing. A significant thing and so even though it was a monotonous task even though it was just an everyday thing Jesus used this to teach his disciples about his loving service and why is Jesus teaching them this is because he's actually preparing them for something amen he's preparing them for something greater than just washing someone's feet it was symbolic of his sacrifice. He says to them, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be made clean. And it was somewhat symbolic of what his sacrifice and his blood uh, was going to accomplish for them. In completely washing their lives and making them holy, making them righteous, making them clean. The washing of their feet was also a lesson of how they were to carry out their own ministry. Amen. Jesus is actually preparing these guys to send them out on mission. And so in washing their feet, he's teaching them. 
This is how you are to carry out your ministry. Amen? In verse 14, he says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And that was their ministry. Just like that he came to lay down his life in service and sacrifice, and he proclaimed the message of God, he exemplified it through his life. And so that's what he was teaching them is, you know what, guys, I'm not just sending you out to speak a message, but I'm sending you out in a life of servanthood. Amen. And that's how you are going to make the gospel message make sense to people. Amen. 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 And this is what he's teaching them. So in doing this, and through his life, just his whole life, and everything that he did throughout his ministry, um, Jesus worked it as a servant, number one, of God, his Father, and we see that in numerous examples, he always refers to God, the Father, as why he's doing what he's doing. He never makes it primarily about people. And secondly, as a servant of men. Amen. But all in all, the purpose was to glorify the Father, to glorify God. Amen. And I want you, I'm just pointing this out because often we get lost in either one of those points. We get over um, zealous for glorifying God and we forget about people. Or we get uh, too consumed in serving people and we forget about God. Or we just get consumed in the task that we have to serve God, serve people, but we're not actually aligned in a way where we're actually glorifying Him, where He is being praised for what we are doing. And that's our work. It's that God would get the glory in all that we do. Amen. Amen. You know, right now, I'm just, I'm just thinking, and I see some amazing people out here. You know, I see Sammy, I see Sammy number, uh, you know, Sammy C and Sammy here. And just thinking about their journey throughout this year and their, you know, their football and the club. And, you know, how many people see games? They see games, they see victories, they see losses. But when I see what these men are doing through our Log uh, Logan Metro, is, um, is they're paving a way for our community. The countless young men and, and men of all ages and women and children that benefit from their service through that club, that if they didn't have that, I just wonder what they would be doing with their lives. Amen? And, and I'm not saying this, so, you know, I, I know they're thinking, oh, please don't talk about us like that, you know, because I know that, that, that's how you feel. But uh, we have to honor their, their work. And their obedience, because that's something that God deposited in them as a desire, as a passion. And you can see that it's actually all working beautifully because God's in it. God's in it. I'm sure that they could get up here and just share the miracles of God and just have people come up to them and say, how did you do it? How have you done this? How have you accomplished this? You know, the people they're working with, uh, a lot of those guys, they, they come with trauma, they, 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 you know, linguistic issues, you know, a whole bunch of stuff is in the mix there, and but they've worked at it. Financial uh, dramas there, probably players, we, we don't know, but I imagine there's players there that can't even afford to play. And they're working all this out, paving a way for people, for our people. And, and I know that at the heart of what they're doing is to glorify God. And so, man, I honor you guys this morning. Awesome work this year. Um, I hope you feel proud of yourself and everything that you've done uh, in honoring God in that way. But I just want to use that example, guys, just as one thing. Everything that we're doing is actually laying out ourselves so that God can be glorified, so that people can find a way, find a better way. 
Amen? Find a better way. You know, in addition to Jesus' bizarre act of washing his disciples' feet, just doing that as an act of service and teaching them about servanthood, it represented the preparation for their release. Amen? You know, God's not about holding people in. He prepares and He releases. Amen? He prepares and He releases. That's what Jesus is about. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. That's what God is about. Amen? He washes their feet in preparation for the countless thousands of kilometers that these men were going to travel proclaiming the message of Jesus. Amen? That would have served as a reminder daily as, you know, uh, Peter and, and John and Luke and all these guys are traveling. Just endless kilometers. I'm sure there was days when they would finish and they would sit down and look at their feet and, you know, with blisters and dirty and, and they would just contemplate on that moment that the Master wash their feet. You know, giving them a foot massage. A comforting moment of Jesus just loving them, caring for them, reminding them this is why we're doing what we do. It's for Him. Amen. He laid down His life for us. Amen. They would have been reminded when they were incarcerated without cause, locked up in Roman prisons with shackles, heavy shackles on their legs, on their feet, on their ankles. You know, some commentators speak about, you know, Paul and Silas being in a Roman prison and, and saying that, the, you know, the prisons were built within the sewer systems and then their feet were actually covered in, in, in fecal matter and, and sewage. And it's in those moments that we would remember it is Christ who has sent us. Amen. And no matter what our feet travel through, what we carry matters more. Amen. Amen. Even Isaiah prophesies of that. If you remember that passage, he says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. So feet are quite significant, aren't they? Feet represent a great deal of stuff that matters to carrying the gospel. And it matters where you stand and where you're positioned in your life. <coughs> Amen. We're encouraged to stand and to build our lives upon the rock. It was their feet that would sustain them and uphold them when they were ready to give up. There would have been countless moments that the disciples and the apostles would have felt like giving up. And I'm sure that there was moments that they just wanted to lie down, just, just, just let it go. Another town, another place, you know, we don't even know if we're going to be welcomed there. Am I going to be stoned again? Is there going to be food on the way? Ready to give up. It was those feet that Jesus washed that continued to carry them day by day. Amen. 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 And so when you're doing God's work, it's likely you're going to feel a little tired. And I'm sure that, you know, this time of the year coming towards the end, some of you are, you know, you're feeling it. You're feeling it. And maybe, you know what, you feel a little bit stepped on. You know? It's like, you know, it's like you, you just work so hard in so many different ways. And there's people that you feel like, yeah, they don't really get why you're doing what you do for them. And it's likely you maybe feel a bit stepped on, like they've just used you. Um, and you know what? It's actually a good thing. Because if you, if you feel stepped on, uh, it means that... Um, Becoming a bridge. You're becoming a bridge for someone. 
Amen. Our lives are meant to be stepped on as believers, as Christians. Lives of sacrifice laid down for people to walk upon and to reconnect with God. And so, yes, if you feel stepped on, maybe you're ready to give up. Maybe you the right day, like, I don't know if I want to do Sunday school ministry next year. I feel a bit stepped on by those kids. It, you know, week to week, it's tough. I don't know if I want to do worship ministry. I'm tired. You know what? It's not a bad thing. Because it means you're doing, you're doing your job. And you're doing it well. You know, I had this conversation with some of the teachers at school on, on Friday because they were just frazzled and, you know, had come to the end of term and, and finishing up the term. And, you know, some kids really push it. They really push those buttons and they know how to push those buttons. And just some of our teachers were just really feeling it. And I just felt God say this. You might feel stepped on, but it's not a bad thing. Because you've worked hard. You've worked hard. And you've laid down your life for those kids daily. And so now it's up to you to just lay down and rest. Rest in God. Or He'll lift you up. Psalm 1833 says, He makes my feet like the feet of deer. Amen. Beautiful description. If you've seen a deer just running, making its way through an open field, you know, you know the lions and the tigers and, and the predators, they know they, they can't catch a deer if it's got just an open plain. They know that. That's why they work strategically. And they have to corral it and, you know, corner it and and several of them have to try and work to catch a deer. They just so fast, so light on their feet. And so maybe your feet are tired today. Spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, um, allow God, allow God to carry you. Amen. Amen. Remember, He's done it first. Amen. He did it first. Talking about being stepped on, I was reminded of um, the old, well, I wouldn't say it's old, but it's classic, classic um, gospel um, example. And it's the bridge to hope, the bridge to life. I don't know if you've ever seen this used, um, but, you know, uh, Billy Graham uses it a lot in his ministry, the Navigators um, the ministry and evangelistic ministry use it a lot, and it's the idea of Jesus becoming the bridge to life. Anybody seen that before? Uh, it says, you know, the idea that we're disconnected from God, and there is a great chasm, a great chasm that we cannot cross over to, to God. And so what Jesus did through his sacrifice and through his life is he actually becomes the bridge. And so we must walk upon, by faith, upon Jesus to reconnect back to God. And so I was reminded of this and, and, and I began to see myself and see my life somewhat like that bridge. Because all of us in some way are actually making a way for someone to reconnect back to God. Amen. Amen. And if your life is not like that, I'll, man, I'm encouraging you to get involved in some way, Amen. becoming a bridge for someone, Amen. to find Jesus, Amen. to find God. Amen. Amen. It's not easy. It's not easy. But, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the Word of God. And obedience here at Power Church, yeah. and that's where it comes hand in hand. Yeah. You know, I pictured myself, and I don't know if this is. Uh, hopefully, I can get this across to you. 
But on one side, you've got the Word of God. You can picture a bridge usually has, you know, uh, whether it's a beam or, you know, if you have a suspension bridge, you have uh, cables running down one side and then down the other side and then the structure is held up. Okay, you can just picture that. Um, and so on one side, it's the Word of God. Everything that we know, um, God is telling us and teaching us on how to do it. But on the other side is our actual behavior. It's the stuff that we do. Our actions. Amen. And they need to go hand in hand. Like we need to actually hold on to what God is telling us to do. And then our actions. And we become the bridge. Amen. Amen. Our lives become the bridge Amen. upon people, the, the one that people look across toward Amen. God. We are like the planks that live between the word and the action that people are looking for. Our way of living is the example of the gospel. Your sacrifice makes a way for people to cross. Amen. Do you know, there's nothing more effective than authentic ministry when it comes to actually reaching out to people. We know that, right? We all look for authenticity. Even when we buy stuff, we know the difference, yeah? You know, we've got a lot of people walking around in um, copies of Gucci and, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton and... Uh, all this sort of stuff. But when you see an authentic piece, you can tell. You know, it's proper leather, it's, you know, it, it looks the part. Yes, there is some, you know, there is some people out there that make some really good, you know, high quality uh, replicas of stuff. But if you know your stuff, you know an authentic piece. And you know what? People are looking for authenticity in us. Amen. You know, I heard on. Um, I heard a pastor, Pastor Jeff Bly, a few weeks ago share on, uh, I can't remember what he was sharing on exactly, but just something that stuck with me, and he's pastor at Life Church, connected to where I work. Um, but I just want to honor him in this passage, in, 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 in this quote. And it was, the most effective ministers are unpretentious. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And it's true. Because anyone can... can Concoct a message, put together a message, uh, put together an idea, copy something. Um, but we all know who's for real. Amen. Amen. We can see, Amen. hey, this person is not a pretender. Yeah. Amen. This person's the real deal. They know what they're doing. They're doing it with the right heart. Amen. 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 So we're encouraged to be authentic, yeah. authentic leaders. Amen. In the different aspects of life. People are looking to you for authenticity. Evidence. Evidence of Jesus. And we know that scripture tells us that that evidence is the fruit. Amen. Amen. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. And what is that fruit? We know that that fruit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is said to be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so they're the fruits, the evidences of authenticity that we're doing what we're doing through God's supernatural power. Those fruits are not something that we can bring forth of our own ability. Amen? You just think right now when you get upset, your first reaction is not, oh, I'm going to love you through this. You know, if, you, if you're an old school mom, it might be the chunk lady, you know, the thong just it's flying through the house and bang. Gets that kid across the head. And... That's not really love, mum. Then she, mum says, but I love you. I'm trying to teach you something here. You don't do that. 
And then that's the message we're teaching our children. My mom loves me, she smacks me. <laughs> Amen. So we need to be careful how we put these things together. Discipline, love. Patience. Yeah. And some people love to harp and go on about how patient they are. You ever met one of those people? You don't know what I have to put up with. At work, at home. And we know that those people are usually the most impatient people. Because patience is reflected through time in his end. Amen. A real patient person doesn't go on about how patient they are. We know that. So we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in order to produce these fruits. To produce that evidence. And if we want to be fruitful evangelists, we've got to produce spiritual fruit. If we want to reach people, if we want to be able to lay down our lives as a sacrifice, we have to produce spiritual fruits. It's the Holy Spirit that sustains us in order to endure the steps of those who need to reconnect with God. Don't miss this. You want to bring people into the knowledge of Jesus, it's going to take a great deal of work on your behalf to allow the Holy Spirit to shape you and transform you so that you can actually sustain others. Amen? That's what it takes. You become the way. You know, we're very quick to get away from uh, from our duty uh, as Christians sometimes. And we say, no, I'm just going to point people to Jesus. And they're just going to place their faith in Jesus. And yeah, that's true. Okay. And, but we isolate ourselves from that. And we're like, well, it doesn't really matter what I do. You know, just look to Jesus. But they're looking at you. You show me Jesus. You tell me he changed your life. Amen. Show me that. Yeah. Amen. Um, okay. Hebrews 12.1 encourages us saying, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Amen. James 1.12 encourages us. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Last week, I got to run 16 kilometers. It was a thoroughly enjoyable experience. 150 Burpee pull-ups in order to fundraise for our youth retreat. It was an amazing time. And I'm not lying, it was so much fun. You know why? Because I wasn't alone. There's some things that make a difference and enable you to run the race with perseverance. One of them is having the right people around you. So important to have the right people around you. You know, that whole time I had my sister-in-law and she was actually lapping me because she's like a number one runner. She runs like every single day and she was lapping me. Like she would finish a lap and then she'd start another one and I was like, whoa, man, take it easy. But every time, she's like, let's go, let's go, come on, you can do this. And I remember one of the guys that came to support and do, you know, he did a couple of laps. He actually gave up halfway and she crowds this guy and she's like, turn around, turn around, you're going the wrong way. And he's like, no, I'm done. And she literally grabbed me by the shirt. It's like, no, 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 it's this way. And so to run with perseverance, it makes a difference to have the right people on your team. It makes a difference when you have purpose for what you're doing. Amen? To have mission. Not many people get up and they just run 16 kilometers. I'm telling you, I wouldn't do that just... 
I don't get up on a Saturday and go, I'm going to run 16 kilometers today. I don't do that. It's not normal for me. But there was a purpose. As I finish, I want to take us to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to look to the right captain. 